Hey there, welcome back to my camera collection. In today's video, yes, we are going to be looking at 10 iconic camcorders from the past. There's a lot of iconic camcorders out there, so obviously I couldn't fit all of them into one video. Now, these are mostly based off of popularity, not necessarily quality-wise or uh, what they could do. With that being said, let's get into today's video. So the video footage might look a little bit different. Um, I just got a brand new GoPro Hero 10 and I'm just trying it out. So let me know if you like the way that the, uh, the GoPro looks. Number 10, we're starting off with the Canon GL2. Now, the reason I put the GL2 at number 10 instead of the GL1 is because I feel like it beats out the GL1 just a little bit more in popularity. It's a little bit bigger of a camcorder and it fits in your hand a little bit better than the GL1 does and has a little bit better video footage. This and its little brother, the GL1, is kind of considered the uh, the budget option for uh, skateboarding camcorders. And it's generally what people get if you can't afford a Sony model or a Panasonic model in a similar body style like this. Still a great camera, I enjoy them, but a lot of people don't like them because a lot of them end up having uh, tape deck issues either they have problems ejecting or reading tapes or something always happens with uh, them being able to read tapes or something like that. A lot of people in the action sports and uh, skateboarding community, they don't really care for them that much. But if you are a younger person out there who just wants to get into uh, filming skateboarding on like tape and make it look old school, this is a great starter camera for you. Just because of the, it's got the flip out LCD screen. It has a, a nice viewfinder on it, uh, a nice mic on it. If you have a fisheye from a, if, if you've used like a VX1000 before, it uses the same size uh, lens threads on it. It's a 58 millimeter. You can find like Optica 0.3X super wide fisheyes, uh, really easy for it. And they generally only cost for a nice one, they cost maybe like 200, 250 bucks, maybe 300, depends on if someone's being stingy. Another thing that makes it great too is it obviously has this top handle for you to be able to film fisheye and get low uh, angles for it. But it also has two zoom functions here on top and then here on the side, if you're using it uh, handheld like this. And it also has two record options. So you got the one traditional spot on the back here. So if you're holding it handheld like so, or if you're filming fisheye or just wanna get a low uh, angle on it, you have one right up here on top. And of course it has a, well, it's technically a hot shoe, but it's also a cold shoe. Um, this little spot up here, so you can mount lights or mics if you want to. Um, if you want to get better audio, or if you want to do like skateboarding at night and film at fisheye or whatever, you can do that. It's a very versatile camcorder, I think, for, for beginners out there if they want to make a, kind of more crusty looking skate videos. And fun fact, this camera was used to film Lonely Child back in 2005. So some of the specs are, it records onto mini DV tapes and it came out in 2003. It has a quarter inch three CCD sensor inside of it that creates 410,000 pixels. The maximum shutter speed on this guy is one in 15,000. The minimum illumination for it is six lux. The viewfinder image creates 180,000 pixels. And in my personal opinion, I think it creates a great colored image along with great audio in my opinion. So that is number 10 on my list. Let's move on to number nine. Now all the cameras on this list, I'm not gonna have a physical model of them, so I will show up pictures and stuff like that of it. For number nine, we are talking about the Canon XL1S. Now this camera, it's not ninth on our list because it's a bad camera, but it's ninth on our list because when it first came out, it was way out of most people's price range. So a lot of people didn't really get it until later on, once it was, uh, it, it came down more in price. The original price for the Canon XL1S was $4,700. And nowadays you can pick one up off of eBay for about 250 bucks, depending on how nice or abused it is. And what made this camera really unique and special from back in the day is if you were ever into uh, shooting pictures on Canon SLR cameras from back in the day, you know, that shot like 35 millimeter film or took pictures on 35 millimeter film and uh, you had to go and, uh, you know, go to like Walgreens and uh, they would create pictures for you and put them in an envelope and you take them home. Well, the lenses that were compatible on those 
old SLR cameras were also compatible with the Canon XL1, XL1S, and the XL2. You could really just transfer all of those lenses if you had them and make videos with them. I think you had to get like a little adapter for it to work for it though. So it made uh, filmmaking kind of more versatile and you could get different kinds of shots with it. But a few downsides for this camcorder is it only has a viewfinder on it. Uh, it had kind of an option where you could actually turn a little dial on it and you could kind of turn it into a little screen or you could like magnify it and have it as like a viewfinder. But the screen was, uh, it was almost too small for you to actually actually use it as a screen, the viewfinder was. But that also goes for the XL1, XL1S, and the XL2. None of them had LCD screens on them, they only had viewfinders. So you had to rig up a monitor on it if you wanted to actually use it for, uh, use like an LCD screen with it. The camera also, when it was fully assembled, uh, lens, lens hood, uh, the mic, the viewfinder, battery in it, uh, shoulder strap, or sh shoulder mount, it weighed uh, six pounds, four ounces, which is pretty heavy for a camcorder, but it was also 16 and a half inches long, which is ridiculously huge to actually try and maneuver around in a lot of situations. So really packing this camera around was really hard. Um, if, if you wanted to store it and take it with you, like put it in your car and move scenes or whatever, <laughs> if you're filming a movie or uh, it, whatever you're doing with it, it you'd have to take everything apart. So you take the lens off, you take the mic and the viewfinder off, you would take the, the shoulder strap off or the, the shoulder mount, and it would all break down into all these different pieces and then you'd put it in a carrying case, shut it, lock it up, put it in your car, drive to the next spot, open it up, put it all back together, and then, and then you can start filming. So a lot of times you couldn't really just hold it handheld and sh shoot and record. It was uh, mainly like shoulder, you put it on your shoulder and record. Other than that, you, you could hold it down low, but like I said, it doesn't have an LCD screen on it, so then you'd have to rig up a monitor for you to actually do like uh, filming without looking through the viewfinder. And I feel like even nowadays, a lot of people don't want to use this thing and pack it around to try and film things. So I think a lot of people generally just get them as, I wouldn't say decorations, but almost just like a like a collector's item. And yeah, you might go out in your backyard and film some stuff with it. But other than that, I don't think people are really out filming with these anymore. They're just too big. And that's really why I'm putting it as number nine is because it's just, it's too big to film a lot of stuff with. So the reason why they called it the XL1S is because they improved a few things inside of it. So it's still really just an XL1. It just had a few more features in it. So one of the features was custom keys. So you could favorite certain menu functions in it to certain buttons so that you could get to them a lot quicker. The XL1 didn't have that. And so they added that to the XL1S. They also enhanced the white balance and added a, a zebra effect to it so you can actually monitor your exposure. Along with improved gain controls to improve performance and ease of use. And the XL1S was also used to film 28 days later and full frontal. It records on the mini DV tapes and it was released in 2001. The maximum shutter speed on it is 1 in 15,000. The minimum illumination for it is 2 lux and the filter diameter on it is actually a 72 millimeter so it's a pretty big lens on the front of it and the viewfinder on it produces 180,000 pixels and the Canon XL1 also has a quarter inch 3C CD sensor in it. That does it for number nine. Let's move on to number eight. Number eight is the JVC GY-X2. Now, I picked this camcorder because I think it might be one of the best VHS camcorders ever made. Now, I'm not saying that from a uh, personal experience or anything like that, but from what it actually has uh, packed in it and uh, feature-wise. So, it's a super VHS camcorder that records onto full VHS tapes. JVC GY-X1 was actually, uh, it actually recorded onto VHS-C tapes. So kind of interesting that the uh, the X2 actually records onto full VHS and the first model of it records onto 
VHS-C or compact VHS. The JVC GY X2 also has a half inch 3CCD sensor on it. So that's a pretty big sensor for a 3CCD style sensor. It actually might be one of the only camcorders I've seen with a half inch sensor on it. So then that makes it a 3CCD Super VHS camcorder, which is super weird to even say because Thinking about VHS camcorders, they're generally some of the lowest quality <laughs> uh, camcorders uh, ever. So hearing that it has a half inch 3CCD sensor in it, crazy. So if you want to film on VHS and have the best possible quality for video, this is the, the, the camera to get. Only issue is, from looking at the, uh, the the footage that I'm presenting, this is a huge camera. So really, you can only put it up on your shoulder or put it on a very stable tripod. Something that can hold quite a bit of weight. And by quite a bit of weight, I mean 13 pounds of weight. This thing is a tank. <laughs> So looking at this camera, you can tell that this thing was never meant to be used for consumer use. This thing is a TV style camera or a movie production style camera and it, I think it looks great for VHS. And I think that's what this camcorder was really intended to do. Film TV, film live broadcasts, and film or uh, like sports events. And this thing cost $7,050 back in 1995. I think it technically actually came out in 1993, um, but in 1995, yeah, it cost $7,000, which is insane. 7000 Can you imagine what kind of a camera you can get nowadays with for $7,000? That's just crazy. And some of the specs on this guy, I already said this, but it does record to full VHS tapes. Um, it has a full video head drum or a full size video head drum. The minimum illumination on it is 1.5 lux. So this thing does really good in low light. The minimum shutter speed on it is one in 60 and the maximum shutter speed for it is one in 2000. Or if you want to be exact, it's one in 2084.6. And you can connect two microphones through the XLR output, or you can have one stereo microphone through the XLR. So if you do the, the two microphones, they'll be mono, but you can do a stereo microphone if you use both of the XLR outputs. And this thing actually had an advanced editing system inside of it so that you could do professional quality in-camera edits, just to name a few. That is it for number eight. Let's move on to number seven. We are moving a little bit farther into the future and we are talking about the Canon T3i. Now the Canon T3i is obviously not a camcorder, but when it came out, Everybody loved it for video. It was a huge popular camera. It was popular when it came out and it's honestly still pretty popular today and it's pretty iconic. I mean, when you think of the the T3i or the like the TI series, I think what are we at now? The the TAI. When you think of those series or at least when I do, my mind always goes to the T3i. And I think because it was such a popular camera, um, I think it deserves a spot on the list. Now, I'm not putting it podium on the list, but I think it still deserves to be talked about a little bit. One of the reasons it was a very popular camera is because it was one of, if not the first uh, DSLR that Canon made with a flip out LCD screen. Obviously that made it really nice for filmmakers or uh, even making skateboard films because you could uh, attach it to a like filming handle or put like a, a cold shoe handle up on top of it. Uh, you could put a fisheye on it and get down low and film skateboarding. You can get a lot of different angles with it and still be able to see the screen since the screen is pivotable. Nowadays, uh, most of Canon's cameras have uh, flip out LCD screens and a lot of them are actually touch screen. The Canon T3i actually wasn't touch screen. And what made it nice is it was one of the first DSLRs that could record in 60 frames per second. But in my opinion, I think this is one of the DSLRs that really got recording with DSLRs, you know, got the snowball rolling. Like that's really what started the movement for recording with DSLRs. So some of the specs on this Canon T3i, it does record onto SD cards. It was introduced in 2011 and you could buy it for $800. So that's a great price for what it was back in the day. I think even nowadays, I think uh, the T7i and the T8i are actually still in that ballpark of uh, price range. You could record at 1080p and you could do uh, your aspect ratio at 16 by nine at 30 frames 
25 frames or 24 frames per second. It could record 720p at 16 by 9 at 60 or 50 frames a second. Or you could do 480p, 4 by 3 aspect ratio at 60 or 50 frames a second. It has a 3 inch LCD screen on it producing 1,040,000 pixels and it also has a 9 point CMOS sensor in it, which is pretty traditional even nowadays with Canon DSLRs. So that is it for number seven. Let's move on to number six. Number six is the VX before the VX. And that is the Sony DCR VX3. Reason why it is number six on our list is because, well, it was the VX before the VX. It was mostly popular in the skateboarding industry. Skateboarders loved it because it had that top handle on it and you can attach a fisheye to it to be able to follow skaters around and get up close and personal. And because it had a great 3CCD sensor on it, which a lot of cameras in this era did not actually have 3CCD sensors in. It's actually one of the only Hi8 camcorders to have a 3CCD sensor in it. Skateboarders loved it because of the professional capability of it in a relatively small size camcorder. It also has a manual focus ring and manual zoom. Now I couldn't find any information on it but I do believe it has the uh, 58 millimeter lens threads on it so I think you were able to use like a Mark 1 Century Optics fisheye on it or even nowadays you can use like an Optica uh, 58 millimeter fisheye on it which made it great back then because when the VX1000 came out people were able to just keep their keep their fisheye and just upgrade to the new camera and continue recording with the same fisheye. So the Sony DCR VX3 came out in 1992 and it was manufactured all the way up to 1995 and was taken out of production for the new favored VX1000 since camcorders were starting to move to the mini DV format. They were starting to move away from the Hi8 Digital 8 era and move into a even smaller compact mini DV tape and cameras. So some of the specs on this guy, it was released in 1992 for $3,500, which is pretty steep for 1992. Even today, that's pretty steep for a camera. It has a third of an inch 3CCD sensor in it, producing 410,000 pixels, which created a horizontal resolution better than 530 lines. So that is my pick for number six, the Sony DCR VX3. Let's move on to number five. My number five pick for most iconic camcorders of all time is the Panasonic HBX 170. Now the reason why I'm putting this at number five or even on this list in general is because I feel like the HPX 170 is really what camcorder is replacing the VX 1000. It's kind of the the now HD VX 1000. It doesn't take tapes anymore. That one is the uh, HVX 200, which was the, uh, the the previous model of the HPX 170, but it records onto P2 cards, Panasonic P2 cards. And since the VX1000 is starting to get harder and harder to find uh, more replacement parts for or even to uh, find parts to fix it in general, a lot of people are starting to slowly transition into HD recording just because it's we're moving farther and farther away from the, uh, the SD era and uh, HD is kind of where it's at. But the HBX170 also just kind of has that grimy, grungy SD look even though it is HD, which is pretty interesting. It still has a 3CCD sensor in it, which is probably one of the reasons why it still has that kind of grimy, grungy look to it. And it also has a traditional Leica lens system in it that Panasonic loves to use. And of course it has a traditionally large LCD screen at 3.5 inches. Panasonic loves to put huge LCD screens on their camcorders. This camera also has a huge 72 millimeter lens threads on it, so you're going to be running a hefty boy of a fisheye on it. It also has two XLR ports on it so you can get even better audio with it. I would say the downside on this is that it records onto the Panasonic P2 cards which they generally go for about $150 to $250 uh, depending on what size uh, capacity that you get and it can also make it a bit of a hassle to transfer your video footage over to your computer. Uh, you 
have to find a Panasonic P2 card reader. But all in all, this camera is actually a lot more readily available today since its price has significantly dropped from $5,200. That was the original MSRP back in 2008. And nowadays you can find them for about 850 bucks for a decent one, which is still pretty steep in my opinion, especially for a camcorder that's 14 years old. So some of the specs on this guy, you can record 1080i at 60 frames per second. It comes equipped with color bars and zebra, so you can monitor your exposure. It has a third of an inch 3CCD sensor in it. The maximum shutter in it is 1 in 2000 and the minimum shutter is 1 in 12 so it goes pretty low. It has manual gain selects at 18, 12, 8, 6, 3, and 0. The viewfinder produces 235,000 pixels and the 3.5 inch LCD screen produces 210,000 pixels. And that is my number five pick on this list, the Panasonic HPX 170. My number four pick for most iconic camcorders of all time is the Sony DCR TRV900. This one just barely misses a podium spot sitting at number four. And this little guy is actually considered a mini VX1000. A lot of skateboarders love this camera because it has a very similar look to the VX1000. A lot of these cameras you'll know that they're very popular in the skateboarding community or action sports community in a whole. If you can't or couldn't afford a VX1000, this was like your next best option. Since it shares a similar 3CCD sensor as the VX1000, your video footage looks practically almost the same. It also recorded two mini DV tapes, which was practically the standard at this time. This camera came out in 1998, so it was uh, pretty established at this time. One weird characteristic about it was that it has a 52 millimeter lens thread on it. Running a fisheye, I think you had to run a few adapters for it to actually work, like a couple step-up rings. This little camera was great because it was such a powerful camera in such a small package of a camcorder body. And it also made quick shooting look a lot more professional since it had a 3CCD sensor in it and a few other more professional kind of features in it. And I would say this camcorder along with the VX1000, I think are, they're kind of hard to find uh, well working ones for a decent price. And if it is a good working one, it usually goes for quite a bit of money. And fun fact, this camcorder was actually used to film the movie Lovers from 1999. I think it was like a French movie. And some of the specs on this guy is it has a quarter inch 3CCD sensor on it, creating 380,000 pixels. The viewfinder creates 180,000 pixels. And the LCD screen produces 184,000 pixels. So just a slight better resolution than the viewfinder. And what's nice about it is it also has a 3.5 inch LCD screen. So you get a big LCD screen with a lot of pixels in it. And the original MSRP on this guy back in 1998 was $2,300. It's got a minimum shutter speed of one in four and a maximum shutter speed of one in 10,000. Along with that, the minimum illumination for it is eight lux. So it doesn't do super great for low light recording, but not bad. It also has night shot. So that is my pick for number four, the Sony DCR TRV900. Number three on my list is the Panasonic DVX100. I'm putting this one as number three because this camera has been loved by so many different industries throughout the years. It would be inappropriate to not put it as a podium finisher. So this camera has been loved in the action sports community, like uh, from skateboarding, scootering, snowboarding, uh, you name it. It's also taken part in documentaries like Murderball, Iraq and Fragments, along with TV shows like Ghost Adventures, The Man from Earth, and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. In fact, the first five seasons of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia was recorded with the Panasonic DVX100. It was actually the first consumer affordable camcorder that could record 24 frames per second in progressive, so 24p. No more interlaced 24p. But you could also record in 30p or 60i, or 30 frames per second in progressive mode, or 60 frames per second in interlaced. And this camera as well had a 3CCD sensor in it. And at this point, you can probably tell if you wanted a nice camcorder, you gotta have something with a 3CCD sensor in it. 
or at least back in the day. And this camera is actually still pretty popular within the classic camcorder community. You can find quite a bit of these actually still in pretty good condition because they did make a A model and a B model. The B model had more features than the A model and uh, I think it actually had it produced a better video image than the A model. I think a lot of these cameras were actually produced. So some of the specs on this guy is it does record to mini DV tapes. It did come out in 2002 for about $4,000. So that wasn't too bad for a camcorder that was so capable of doing so many different things. It had a third of an inch 3 CCD sensor in it, producing 410,000 pixels. The minimum illumination for it is 3 lux, so it does pretty well in low light. This camcorder also has a 3.5 inch LCD screen, producing 200,000 pixels, and the viewfinder produces 180,000 pixels. So that is my third place pick, the Panasonic AG DVX100. My pick for number two spot is the JVC GRC1. This is the famous red JVC camcorder from Back to the Future and the Netflix series Stranger Things. This camcorder debuted in 1984 and it was the first VHSC camcorder to hit the market. Now what made this camcorder revolutionary is VHS camcorders from back then, you actually had the camcorder and then you had the tape deck separate. So you pretty much had to pack around the camcorder and the VCR that it recorded to as well. And then you had cables in between. This was the first camera that you didn't actually have to do that with. And another thing that set it apart, which was revolutionary back in 1984, is you could actually watch your footage through playback function. So you could actually rewind the tape on the camera and then watch it through the viewfinder or you could attach it to your TV through your AV cables and watch your home movies that way. There was no more having to take the VHS tape out and put it into your VCR to rewind it and watch it. Another way that you could have done it is they made adapters. So it was like a big uh, VHS tape and you took the VHSC tape and you stuck it in there, closed the lid and it like kind of wound up and then you'd put the big, the whole contraption into your VCR and you could watch your video clips that way. It kind of tricked your VCR into thinking that there was an actual uh, VHS tape in there. All the cameras that we've talked about today all have three CCD sensors on them, but three CCD sensors weren't invented at this time yet. So this thing actually had a half inch SATA cone pickup tube in it. And to top it off, the JVC GRC1 has been voted into the top 100 gadgets of all time. So that little statement alone actually, I think actually puts it into the podium bracket of this video. Just because, I mean, obviously this wasn't f popular within filmmaking or skateboarding or anything like that, but just the pop culture relevance of it. Y you see the camera and you know exactly what shows it's from. So everybody knows where this camera came from. It's a, it was a revolutionary uh, camera from its time, but pretty uh, pretty outdated in today's world. Um, you can still find these out and about on eBay. They're kind of expensive. They may or may not work. I don't believe you can find batteries for them anymore. So if you do want one, you probably should find one that also has a power supply with it if you want to be able to use it. But all in all, these are mostly just collector's items at this point. It's the fact that you got, hey, I got the Marty McFly camcorder. So some of the specs on it, it records onto VHS-C tapes or compact VHS tapes. The original MSRP on this guy was $1,500 back in 1984. One cool thing about it is the mic on it was actually removable. So a little uh, foam mic, you could actually unplug it and then you could put in your own mic on it. So nowadays, if you wanted to, you could plug in like a a powered uh, road mic. You were also able to plug in a wired remote so you could use uh, the functions from it uh, from a, a, a remote and it also had a headphone jack so you could actually monitor your audio. From the sounds of it from me um, doing a little bit of research that was pretty revolutionary for uh, 1984. Most cameras didn't have a way for you to unplug the mic and put a better one in there or be able to even monitor your audio. So that is my number two pick for the most iconic camcorders of all time, the JVC GR-C1. My number one pick, 
you probably guessed what it was going to be. My number one pick is the Sony VX1000. Of course, you probably knew that this was going to be number one. But at the same time, how could it not be number one? I mean, it's the most sought after vintage camcorder of all time. I mean, when you think of vintage camcorder, what's the first camera that comes to mind? The VX1000. When you think of mini DV, what's the first camera that comes to mind? The VX1000. When you think of filming skateboarding fisheye, what's the first camera that comes to mind? The VX1000. When you think of POV porn videos, what's the first camera that comes to mind? The VX1000. Yeah, you heard that right. The VX1000 was actually very popular in uh, filming porn. <laughs> it was popular because of its uh, video quality back in the mid-90s. I mean, it was Sony's first professional mini DV camcorder, and it had a 3 CCD sensor in it. Plus, it was a relatively small camcorder for that time, so getting uh, up and close to uh, your footage was uh, pretty... It, uh, it made getting up close and personal with POV shots a lot easier to do. They even used wide angles and fish eyes to uh, film the videos as well. Chances are if you own a VX1000, 2000, or 2100, those were all used in the uh, porn industry and you just might have uh, a camera that's been used at a set and whether you like it or not, you might have got it might have gotten something a little a uh, little juicy on it. Oof. So the VX1000 was Sony's first mini-DV professional camcorder, along with its little brother, the consumer model, the VX700. And the VX1000 would be produced from 1995 to 2000 until it was eventually replaced with the Sony VX2000. Kind of ironic that the 2000 came out in 2000. And then later on, the VX2000 would be replaced by the Sony VX2100 in 2003. Now, the VX1000 has been used to film a lot of different beloved skate videos like Baker 3, Yeah Right, Photosynthesis, the DC video, This Is Skateboarding, and Fully Flared, just to name a few. Also, a few movies have been filmed with this camcorder as well, like Chuck and Buck, The Idiots, Wind Horse, Journey on the Plane, which I think is like a, to me it seems like a, like a Russian movie, and the famous Jackass series. I think season one through five, or one through seven, I believe, was recorded with it. So all in all, this camcorder has been loved by many different industries of uh, filmmaking, and is still loved by retro camcorder enthusiasts like myself. I would love to have a VX1000 someday. So the original price for this camcorder back in 1995 was $3,500, which is pretty steep, and it still holds a pretty penny to this day. If you can find a well-working one, they're generally about 750 bucks to about $800. And if you can find somebody who's selling one with a Century Optics Mark I fisheye or Mark II, that's going to drive the price up even more because those are even hard to come by. But if you want a little bit of a cheaper model, you can always get yourself a Japanese model. Um, but you're not really going to know what any of the buttons do because everything's in Japanese. If you buy one, you can always uh, mark it with uh, like scotch tape or something and write it right on Sharpie on it and kind of label what's what. You might be able to do some research online and find what button does what. So some of the specs, it does record onto mini DV tapes. Obviously it was the, the first professional camcorder that Sony made on mini DV tapes. Um, it only has a manual focus ring. Um, later models like the 2000 and 2100 have a zoom ring and a focus ring. It has a third inch 3 CCD sensor on it producing 410,000 pixels each. And the only downside to it in my opinion, I th it doesn't have an LCD screen. Instead where the LCD screen would actually be sitting, uh, you will notice that that's where the tape deck is. So most camcorders uh, that take mini DV tapes, they're on the side where the hand strap is, where your hand sits, and it opens out that way on the right side of the camera. But the VX1000 and the 700 are actually on the left side. And one nice thing about it is it does have a colored viewfinder and it creates 180,000 pixels. The Sony VX700 also has a colored viewfinder. It has a minimum shutter speed of one in four and a maximum shutter speed of one in 10,000. And it has a minimum illumination of four lux. 
so it does okay with low light recording. All right, we made it through. That is my top 10 picks for the most iconic camcorders of all time. Did I miss any? Did I miss your favorite camcorder? Is there any other camcorders that you would replace on this list? And if you like this video, let me know and maybe I'll turn this into a series. I'll do a, a part two or part three and keep on going with this. There's so many iconic camcorders out there that I had to narrow it down to a top 10 of what I could find. So thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you like it and subscribe if you like checking out old camcorders like I do. And on that note, we'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.